Kuyarko. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we can see diminishing returns are setting a lot, but that's okay. We'll try and still manage it. So my name is Daniel Joe Ahinfo, and I'm your <coughs> moderator for this session. Uh, for this session, um, I mean, for the past two days, we have heard all the story is telling us is that uh, HDP remains a major cause of maternal mortality and morbidity. And uh, this afternoon, we are very lucky to have with us Dr. Henry K. Kumi, who is a consultant, obstetrician, gynecologist uh, at, our, at our premier hospital, Kolebu Tichin Hospital. Uh, as advertised, um, he's going to talk to us about improving the, the, uh, the delivery of emergency obstetric care, a, a catalyst for minimizing adverse outcomes of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So basically, Dr. Kumi is somebody who is driven by the pursuit of <coughs> excellence and also believes in teamwork and the power of leadership. Um, so he wants to take a lead, or he wants to provide leadership in this area to help solve this problem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, your presenter, Dr. Henry K. Kumi. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, as has been said, I'll be talking about improving the delivery of emergency obstetric care as a catalyst for minimizing adverse, pregnant, uh, adverse outcomes of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Um, I, I will start by um, narrating a story that is carved out from uh, doctors in the district. And this is a story of Madame Essay, who was a 32-year-old gravida 6, para 5, and was rushed to a district hospital one night. She was a non-attendant, and her seven-month pregnancy was unplanned. She was referred from a nearby health center two hours away, linked by a deplorable road, as a case of sudden loss of consciousness. The referral BP was 200, I mean 220 over 110. Urine proteins were not checked on account of no strips. And after history and exam, the midwives made a diagnosis of eclampsia and started her on magnesium sulfate protocol. As it was found out that the referring facility said that they were uncomfortable given max sulfate. And in fact, the max sulfate they, they had had expired because they've not been given it for some time. Being the only doctor on call at the entire maternity, the surgeon arrived late, but the patient had already been prepared for surgery and was sent to theater. Of course, she delivered an FSB. She had the placental abruption postoperatively. Her urine output gradually dwindled. A diagnosis of acute kidney injury was made, but patient continued to deteriorate finally referred to the tertiary center, but patient passed on. A colleague from the referring center called two days later to find out what had happened to the patient, only to find out that the patient had passed on. Now it became quite clear that the ability to perform life-saving procedures and having skilled staff will not always be enough. I think yesterday Dr. Sopoko talked about 
too little, too late. I'll go through an introduction and then walk us through the role of emergency obstetric care. As we all know, childbirth is universally celebrated. Yes. Sorry. So childbirth is universally celebrated, but pregnancy and childbirth are not always a joyful experience, as has been narrated here. And in all Ghanaian societies, the death of a woman from pregnancy-related complication is considered a tragic event, sometimes requiring elaborate ritual purification of the whole society. In fact, to prevent maternal morbidity and mortality, some Ghanaian societies even have elaborate dietary and behavioral codes instead for the expectant woman to ensure safe delivery uh, of a normal infant. Now, the death of women during pregnancy, childbirth, or in the postpartum period was once a common occurrence worldwide. And I must hasten to add that this statement is only true for the developed world. Today, as has been said, up to about 99% of maternal deaths occur in our part of the world. The question is, what has the developed world done differently? As we all know, I mean, this is just to highlight the size of the problem we have at hand, that pregnancy is a normal physiologic state occurring mostly in young and apparently healthy individuals. So sometimes people think that they don't need care. Of course, we also all know that maternal mortality and morbidity are multisectorial. But this is to emphasize a point that the factors which promote health and precipitate ill health or death are not purely genetic or biologic, but they can be social, economic, cultural, and psychological. And these elements can actually work together or against one another in the life of one individual. I think this has been talked about. Now, again, maternal mortality is just the tip of the iceberg and the vast base for, for it is maternal morbidity, which remains undescribed, and this is where hypertensive disorders come in. Of course, maternal mortality is also more than just uh, numbers. Each maternal death must be considered one too many because of a devastating effect on the family and the whole society. Of course, for the woman, well, for women, they are deprived from leading long and prosperous lives. And then, as we all know, it has devastating effect on children, the family, and the entire country. This is important to appreciate. This has been mentioned, and I just want to highlight the contribution of hypertensive disorders uh, we know that things like obstructed labor, as time has gone on, have dropped out, but this still remains, and we must uh, appreciate this. Now, I brought this thing up not to just talk about hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, but I want to emphasize that it may predate pregnancy or develop early in pregnancy or it may have serious I mean, risk factors that predispose to their development. And it's important to realize that the availability of skilled attendant is therefore needed in the whole continuum of care from uh, early pregnancy through to uh, delivery. Now, accurate diagnosis is helpful for making management decisions regarding whether inpatient care is necessary the timing of delivery, the need for anticonvulsants, and then assessing maternal prognosis. You know, whilst the mothers are with us, we also have to think about their health even after pregnancy. Now, I brought these things up to highlight 
something that has been highlighted already. And as far back as in 2010, Professor Odoi is here, and they did work that, of course, demonstrated the fact that hypertensive disorders actually remain high in terms of contribution to maternal mortality in the Confanoche Teaching Hospital. And Dr. Gumanga and his team also did some work in the three teaching hospitals we have. And as you can see, hypertensive disorders feature prominently uh, in the causes of maternal mortality. And then finally, uh, Dr. Boafo has been here with us and he did some work here in Kolebu. And yes, for a long time, hemorrhage has been the leading cause of maternal mortality, but it's been overtaken by hypertensive disorders. Now, why am I talking about maternal mortality? As has been presented so far, in spite of the significant achievement made to reduce preventable maternal mortality, the contribution of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy is still rising. And I'll quickly show this. This is just last month uh, in Kolebu Teaching Hospital, our mo mo mortality, morbidity audit. And these are the major complications we have. And as you can see, as much as 98 total number is all hypertensive disorders. Compared to all the other uh, complications we have, hypertensive disorders still stand uh, tall. So the question is, why, I mean, what are the causes of adverse outcomes in hypertensive disorders of pregnancy? Oftentimes, it is due to late diagnosis, misdiagnosis, inappropriate intervention, and then uh, delayed intervention. And this may be due to patient factors, provider factors, and then social factors as well. Now, I brought these pictures to show you these are real life pictures of patients that were seen just the past weekend. I mean, you can actually see the dates. Now, this is a patient that was seen in a, in a hospital um, on Saturday. The blood pressure was written in red. The patient was said to be well and was given another date to present. Of course, this patient went back after three days with severe low abdominal pain. She had a placental abruption and lost the baby. Uh, the next one, as you can see, See, from this date in April, her blood pressure had already started rising. No action. And then she goes back with this before referral. Also, placental abruption and loses the baby. Now, what is the evidence for emergency obstetric care? as much as 15% of pregnancies will result in obstetric complications. And it's important to realize that these complications may not be predicted, even in uh, well-nourished, well-educated uh, women. Now, while some studies uh, have said that we've made significant progress in this area, some conditions cannot be uh, prevented. Now, I must say here that the maternal mortality ratios about 150 years ago in Europe and the United States were similar to what we have uh, here. But what have they done differently? With the advent of uh, antibiotics, blood transfusion, proper surgical techniques, they have managed to reduce their maternal mortality significantly. And this is compelling evidence for a strong association between the ability to treat serious obstetric complication and the reduction of maternal mortality, especially since maternal mortality had not declined significantly in the previous 80 years. This is in Europe mainly. Now, this is to state that low maternal mortality ratios in developed countries today are due in large part to the fact that obstetric complications are identified and treated promptly in the context of a functioning health system. 
Now, what evidence then exists that emergency obstetric care prevents maternal deaths in developing countries? And it, it is instructive to understand that the top causes of maternal mortality are the same all over the world. And the means by which the maternal mortality has been reduced in the developed, the developed world are to a large extent actually available to us. And what am I talking about? Antenatal care, antibiotics, blood transfusion service, safe anesthesia, improved cesarean section techniques. What is actually missing here is widespread health literacy, improved socioeconomic conditions, and then quality care, which has been talked about a lot here. Now, programs to reduce maternal mortality in resource poor settings where ratios are high must therefore be able to promptly, tr uh, promptly treat these complications. And this is where the WHO and its partners have identified a package of medical interventions required to treat the seven major direct obstetric causes of maternal morbidity. And this package, as we know, is described as emergency obstetric care. Now, this describes the timely provision of more specific interventions during life-threatening uh, conditions. Now, health facilities by this are classified as either basic emergency obstetric care facilities or comprehensive based on their actual provision of certain life-saving service known as signal functions in the preceding three months. And these are historic indicators. Now, these are often the indicators used. I'll just go through that. If a facility is able to administer uh, parenteral antibiotics, administer eutrotonics, parenteral anticonvulsants, manual removal placenta. If they're able to perform all these things, they are described as basic. And then in addition to these, if the facility is able to perform surgery, for instance, caesarean session, laparotomy for ruptured ectopic, ruptured uterus, and then perform blood transfusion, they are classified as comprehensive emergency obstetric care. Now, I must add here that virtually all treatment of obstetric emergency should be carried out by a provider who falls squarely within the definition of a skilled attendant. And as we all know, this is important, that a skilled attendant is often a nurse, a physician, or a midwife who has been trained you know, to manage uncomplicated pregnancy, childbirth, and the immediate postpartum period, and to be able to refer uh, complications when they arise. And this cannot be separate from the signal functions that I talk about. Now, what is the problem? Let's remember that all countries with low maternal mortality rate have both high proportions of birth attended by skilled attendants. And this is whether they, they are delivered at home or in hospital. But the reality in countries with high maternal mortality is that many women, especially in rural areas, are not giving birth with a skilled attendant, and that there are often no nearby emergency obstetric care facilities available for women with emergencies. And then the next slide, I'll just, just let us know that a lot of improvement have been made in providing skilled attendant anti at the antenatal level, but it drops still with delivery at the health facility. So this is so important to know that many women are attending, but the deliveries are not happening as they should. Now, the quality of emergency obstetric care in low income and middle income settings is often evaluated with signal functions that indicate the capacity of a facility to perform certain life-saving interventions. This is just to say that these are the things that we use, sorry. The signal functions are what we use to assess. Now, usually the performance of signal function within the past three months is verified using patient charts. And I want us to go through this now. The availability of skilled attendant or signal functions may not sufficiently reflect quality of care. There has been therefore conscious effort 
in revising or modifying the readiness uh, of facilities. Because if you go to a facility and you say that they have anticonvulsant, and therefore they are able to offer the service, that may not be wholly right because the ability to even diagnose the condition is what is more important. Now, going on from just signal functions, the obstetric specific service readiness index defines a facility's aggregate obstetric emergency readiness using uh, the mean number of 11 tracer present on the day of observation. So they use tracer uh, functions of tracer items to make the assessment of the facility's readiness, and I'll go through these things. Now, standard signal functions estimates, I mean, standard signal function estimate and the WHO's obstetric service readiness in there do not measure the readiness for each clinical disorder. For example, if you take signal function estimate for preeclampsia with severe features, that will be defined as a proportion of, a faci of facilities with IV infusion sets, IV hydralazine, magnesium sulfate. Now, if you just use these and say that the facility is ready, we lose sight of the fact that the facility may not even have a sphygmo manometer, a stethoscope, urine dipstick testing. And this is important to note here as we move on. Now, readiness estimate based on just signal functions alone, as I've said, do not model how multiple resources are required sequentially or simultaneously for practical clinical management. Now, in hypertensive emergencies, facilities can treat the disorder only when all needed resources to identify and treat the emergency are present simultaneously. And indeed, quality classification based on signal function assumes that provision of certain functions indicate that complications were recognized correctly and managed comprehensively without explicitly measuring the overall quality of care. I think Prof. Doy yesterday gave a very sad story of how she lost her sister also. And yes, the patient finally had attendance, but she was lost. So just using signal function, going historically and finding out they've been able to perform uh, one of the signal functions may not be enough to talk about it. Now, I'll talk about clinical vignettes. In high income settings, clinical vignettes have been shown to better reflect providers' practice than medical record abstract. Now, these are clinical scenarios that provide information about procedural changes needed to improve health outcomes and are an inexpensive way of assessing competence in particular when charts or documentations are incomplete. Now, they provide an opportunity to evaluate whether health worker practice is deficient due to infrastructure or competence. And it helps to identify poorly performing health cadres and target training for such staff. This is work that was done in the Brongahafo region looking at the competence of health workers in emergency obstetric care. Now, in this paper, they assess the competence of health workers' delivery in the Brongahapo region, as I've said. And they assess whether clinical practice was limited um, rather than what the facility has. And I'll go through just a few things that they did. And this is just to add on to the signal functions. As I've said, signal functions alone may not be enough. Yes, so they looked at questions like this. Now you have a 26 year old woman who is seven months pregnant, comes, complain of headache, blood vision, epigastric pain, and her face looks swollen. In this facility, what would you usually do to establish diagnosis? So they went through this thing with the staff, then they followed it up with the fact that if you examine and find out the blood pressure is this, urine protein is three pluses and brisk 
reflexes. How would you manage? These are questions that were posed to the staff in the facility. Now, in this clinical vignette that I've talked about, they found out that doctors and midwives actually performed just moderately well. They were not so good. And the question was whether it was because of lack of competence or because they didn't have the facilities and therefore they've not been practicing for some time. Going on from clinical vignettes, people have proposed the use of what we call clinical cascade model. Now, the, the clinical cascade model is a clinically oriented approach to measuring emergency readiness. And this is based on the practical stepwise cascading relationship between resources. And it goes into three stages. You see, as opposed to the signal function assessment, where you go to a facility and you look into their records, okay, the past three months, have you given IV antibiotics? The past three months, have you given IV anticonvulsant? Have you given antihypertensives? This one goes through a stepwise approach. And at the stage one, they find out, are there resources to identify the emergency as required? Some may not have BP apparatus, some may not have urine dipsticks. At stage two, accurate treatment can be administered. Like I showed, patient had blood pressure that was in the high range, in the severe range, yet no action was taken. And then of course, in the stage three, they look at a facility that is able to monitor and modify therapy as and when uh, required. So going on, as I've said, signal functions in the original among overestimate practical readiness by as much as 50%. But the Cascades Intuitive Indicators can support cross-sector health system or program planners to more precisely measure and improve emergency care. So we think that we should look beyond signal functions. We should look beyond signal functions, consider clinical vignettes, and then clinical cascade model. And in this study, for instance, that was done in Kenya, they found out that although most facilities uh, about 77% stopped maternal signal functions. They lacked a lot of the other things that were connected. So for instance, in hypertensive emergencies, for example, 38% of facilities had resources to identify the condition. That is the stage one readiness. So they had the sphygmal manometers, they had urine dipstick stethoscope and all that. But only 6.8% had the resources to treat the emergency. So these are patients who had to, I mean, facilities who had to refer. So we think that we should look at, and we should look beyond just a clinical cascade and look at how interconnected other things are to our emergency readiness. Now, among facilities should provide vitally needed backup for skilled attendants working in communities in resource poor settings. And I think the important thing here for me in all I've talked about is that we should recognize the interconnectedness between skilled attendants and the enabling environment for them to work. How do we improve the delivery of emergency obstetric care? I think we should focus on teamwork, funding, continuous training and retraining, leadership, and it should be linked to accreditation. And what questions should we or our stakeholders have? Are our facilities equipped with the basic supplies such as sphygmal manometers, dips, urine dipsticks, to be able to identify, as I've talked about, at the stage one level, other than just saying that we have anticonvulsants? Do we have skilled personnel who can identify women at risk of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and offer evidence-based risk reduction prophylaxis. 
I think uh, Dr. Sofonio has talked about calcium. We know aspirin, aspirin is also helpful. Do we have the skilled attendant who will be able to recognize patients who will benefit from these things so that we don't get to the point where they have eclamptic fits? Do we have antihypertensives and anticonvulsants readily available? Are we delivering these services in a humane, patient-centered manner? And then for reductions in facility-based obstetric mortality to occur in Ghana, we think that a strategy-oriented approach to measuring readiness is urgently needed. We all know that it has been the vision of the WHO that every pregnant woman and newborn receives healthy care throughout the pregnancy, childbirth, and the immediate postpartum period. Now, in evaluating the readiness of facilities in managing obstetric emergencies, particularly hypertensive disorders, as has been demonstrated, we need a multi-pronged approach involving not just signal function assessment, but the addition of clinical vignettes and clinical classificate models that will help. Of course, the care must be of good quality, and we all, we've all talked about it, that quality means that it must be safe, it must be timely, efficient, and then patient-centered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think let's clap for him because he's also delivered he's also delivered within time, in fact, two minutes faster. So uh, we haven't had that much. Uh, so let's, let's, let's give him uh, another applause for doing that. Okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Kumi. Uh, you, 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 you don't have anywhere to go, please. <laughs> Um, so I'm sure you have questions. You've heard all the story. I have, I have learned a few things. I mean, in my discipline or as researchers, I can now, I have also seen the power of vignettes. You know, we, in this room, we have been very lucky. We have had true stories of women. Where they've told us what they've gone through yesterday, and, and that alone makes a lot of impact. If we didn't have them, if I were a researcher and I want to get information from professionals like you, I would use vignettes to present the cases and then let us discuss and see how. So, but he has, she, he has also to, told us this uh, afternoon that actually um, in EMOC, vignettes uh, together with, uh, what were the others? Um, a clinical cascade. Uh, can do a lot of things. Uh, please, um, I'm sure you have questions. I'm sure you have comments. I'm sure you have contributions. Let's have them, and, and then let's learn more about the things he has said. Have you, did you use them yourself? You haven't used them yourself. These, these methods you've, you've told us about, you haven't used them yourself. Uh, we've used them in, not in hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, but in other uh, clinical in postpartum hemorrhage, for instance. Uh -huh. So we've had a, more of a simulation okay. where um, we made a group of doctors try what they would do. We give them scenarios and then see what they would do till they say they are done. That's the, that's the end. And then, of course, afterwards, we take them through what they should probably do. And what it came out was that what came out was that checklist was really important and then when people have not practiced something for a long time they, they, they even lose track of it so we've used it in postpartum hemorrhage but definitely in hypertensive disorders in pregnancy because we are talking about this is is very important and sometimes you are not sure whether the people don't know it because technically they don't know or because the facility doesn't have the resources for the, or the infrastructure for them to even uh, use, so they've lost, they've, they've lost it. So we've used it in other, other areas. Okay, so please, uh, I don't want to do the questioning alone. So let's, let's hear from you. Um, do we have mics there, no? Yes. Okay. There are a lot of questions for you. So what, okay. what we'll do is we'll take three questions then we'll let him answer, and then we'll go for the second time. 
Can I see the hands up again? Okay. Good afternoon, once again. I'm Millicent from Rich Hospital. Please, I happen to be a rotation midwife at Achimota. After my um, midwifery training school. And what I realized at their antenatal services was that the most experienced midwives were rather put at the antenatal um, sector. And I happened to work with one antigenet. And I really, I don't know what this woman will miss because she was much particular about certain significant issues on the card. When, after checking the vitals, everything, this woman would sit down herself. She would go through everything and check to see if everything is okay with this client before allowing the client to leave. And if it's necessary for action to be taken, this woman will even carry the card herself sometimes to, to the physician or whoever is available there, follow this client there, and explain everything to the uh, doctor in charge there. See to it that you are being taken care of before she will come back to the room. And in fact, during my experience at, at that place, I really appreciate this fact. But these days, some of our midwives, I work at the triage. Sometimes, um, somebody will come in labor, you will check the BP and it will be high. You will go back to the antenna and you will, you will definitely see something like this 140, 90 issue and those things there. Whilst they didn't even take note of it or even refer the person to the doctor or the whoever is in charge. Sometimes the midwives take it like a 140, it's just the borderline. I think they have those things in mind, and then, okay, when she comes again next time, then we check it, which is not helping. So I think we need the training more. This training has to go, I mean, deep into our institutions and other sectors so that we can see to these problems. Thank you. Yes, so, so first and foremost, I want to thank you so much for such a very brilliant um, presentation. And um, it's, it's been a very great learning experience for me, particularly when you spoke about the issues of drills, the simulations. Now. You know, when it happened, um, my colleagues from Siama General, I could see they were laughing. And um, the challenge for me has been the fact that I am happy that it happened at, uh, I think the earlier study was somewhere in uh, Bronga Hafo. Good. The problem that arises is the fact that there is no share, shared learning. Shared learning. We literally had to start this from the scratch at our facility. We also did simulations because we felt that was one easy way of getting people to be prepared to identify the gaps. Then we can propose and put timelines to how to solve the problems. We finished and then we created a learning platform of Tema General um, Rich Hospital. And then I put it, I, I wrote a summary, like a report of what we had done and shared it on that platform. So all the gynecologists. Only to, uh, when I discussed with somebody at Rich, they told me that they have been doing it. My first question was, so why didn't you share it? Because, you see, it makes life easy. I didn't need to go and reinvent the wheel. Because now it means I had to start from the ground up. So if we can have a shared learning platform where people, when you develop or you, 
you have such very impressive works. You share and show the methodology, how you went around it. If it's possible, share even the questions, how to go about it. You know, it helps to speed up the learning and the adoption of the change. And once again, thank you so very much. Please, I'm told we have five minutes, so make the questions short, okay? Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. I commend you for the wonderful work done. I just want to address our attention to this BP of 140, 90 BP being the threshold for diagnosis of preeclampsia. I think that we should be, these new thresholds had come from the developed countries, but we should be very careful. Anytime new things come, we should have our own internalization and make sure that we are on the right path. What has happened is that here we do have young adolescents getting pregnant because the, uh, the particular one that was presented this morning was 18 years at a blood pressure of 134 over 90. For her, if her normal blood pressure, let's say, is let's say 90, 60, being a young girl, 134 over 90, that is a significant rise. But well, that is about uh, 30 millimeters of mercury rise in the diastolic. But because of these things that have entered our mind, because these are the new protocols that had come, even when the obstetrician was called, he smiled, oh, this is 134 over 90, so let her go home. So we have to be careful how we adopt some of these new protocols that will have come. So definitely, uh, this is something that we have to interrogate, because it's running through. In your presentation, again, it showed up. They circled it in the red ink, but no action was taken, because they are waiting for the threshold. Thank you very much. It's not a question, it's just a comment. So, so so I want to challenge the obstetricians here. You have two questions, so let's add one more. All right. Who has the mic? Yes, um, snappy, eh? snappy. Yes, please. Uh, they will come and suck us. Thank you, Dr. Kumi, for this wonderful presentation. And, um, and in fact, the um, presentation was really thought-provoking. And I was just looking at um, what you said concerning um, our reduction of maternal mortality over the last 80 years hasn't really been, even though it's coming down, it, there hasn't really been much improvement. So I'm just looking at what if we are looking at, we are doing the same thing, and doing the same thing will give you the same result. And as you rightly said, um, one important thing is teamwork. That means all hands should be on deck, which should include political will, and the government. Um, so if you realize, um, one issue is with supply chain and um, the provision of um, emergency medications to our facilities. So if, for example, the uh, young lady that was presented in the morning, let's look at the health insurance system. Could it be that if we have a um, cases that I contribute to maternal mortality, like the hypertensive disorders. Could it be that uh, stakeholders will take it up and say that, okay, with hypertensive disorders, we are allocating this amount of money for it in the HIS, NHIS, let's say 500 Ghana cities, so that when a person comes, the, the, the uh, care is given to that person from the go where it go. So now, by, the, by within 48 hours, they will be mobilizing other funds. Whilst, like, we on the field will be able to take care of this client, like, in terms of labs and all that. And the, the next point is with the simulation. Like, it cannot be overemphasized. I realize that um, when the previous speaker um, mentioned that they actually do drills almost every month when our sister you know, um, um, had that uh, situation. Now, we need to incorporate this in our setting intentionally. It must be intentional. And the, our leaders or those at the forefront must actually, it should be a, a, a will, like it should be intentional in terms of our, um, um, in, in, in our setting here. And then the other thing is with the funding. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to speak. I want to talk about 
passion for the job. Most of I lost a baby because the midwifery woman on duty was making call while my wife was bleeding previously. And uh, by the time she now has time for us, they have to rush her into the theater. And the next thing that happened was we lost the baby. So I told the woman, I said, two persons will meet God today. Either I kill you or you kill me to join this baby. But what, where am I driving at? I now wrote to the government that that woman's certificate should be retrieved. And uh, my wife knelt down and began to beg me that I should please. What he has done is not right, but wrong, two wrong things cannot make right. So please, let us talk about, talk to these our women who are to save life, not to be the one killing the life. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Last yeah. question. Doc, thank you. I wanted to know, like the simulation we've all agreed would help. You spoke about a, a situation where you, wasn't sh you were not sure whether the facility was not having it or the people didn't have the technical knowledge. What do we do in that space? Because sometimes you don't know where you belong. You yourself, you don't know what is happening there. How should we tackle that part? Thank you. Answer. <laughs> Quick one, eh? As brief as you can. <laughs> All right, so I think I'll respond to. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to all the comments. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Shafrino. Thank you very much for what you added. And um, I think the lady who spoke about, I think. Um, Midwives, as experienced ones being put at the forefront. I think it's been talked about here earlier on. And I think the WHO in the, in the new ANC guidelines even mentions that we, we, we need to replace the word visit with contact. Because they think that implicit in the word contact means that something, there was a real encounter. Because sometimes, we all know, sometimes at the antenatal clinic, you may spend less than five minutes with a patient. But as she described, you have someone who will go at all lengths to make sure that they are really done with you. There has been a contact. So I think the point is not so much with whether it should be experienced people or not, but as uh, the gentleman talked about, people who are really committed, okay, they've seen this blood pressure. They are not letting you go until they have escalated the whole situation and gotten a response from People like, I mean, people experience like Dr. Sofran who talked about the fact that, look, this BP, you have to take it in context. Look at her age. So I think the issue of contact is important. Not just that they visited you, say hi, oh, everything is fine. And as I showed, they wrote well. They were doing well. That was it. They, these patients actually just had visit and not uh, proper antenatal contact. So I think we have to take note of that and go uh, to a greater length for our patient. I think the issue of the clinical vignettes and the simulation that should be done. Yes, at the facility level, we can have that. But I think what we want to emphasize is that if you are using just signal functions, you know, the unfortunate thing that he described about losing someone, if the team goes to the facility, if this woman has C-section, of course, she passed on, but they will, they will check that they've done emergency C-section. You know, so that is the problem. So they will have that, though. They, we have good facilities that are able to perform C-section, but how was the C-section performed? Was it performed in a timely manner? And this is where I think the issue of the stimulation should not just be at the facility level, but the people who are doing the evaluation of the facilities should actually come and do simulation. They should sample some of the workers there and see, put them in the situation and then see how they will perform. Because that is actually what tells the readiness. You know, of course, that, that can also include questions as, as, as has been uh, described. So this is important. And I think Dr. Chiklu uh, was trying to make the point that I think managers, uh, heads of departments should really make it a part of their uh, protocols because you know we all know that things like 
should have these stories. They don't happen often, but when they happen, sometimes the, the consequences are disastrous. And until people do simulation on a regular basis, they will, they will forget, you know. So I think um, that is, that is uh, I don't know whether I've, I've uh, left out something. Have we, have we answered all the three questions you ask? Yes. So My friend in green, <laughs> have we answered all your questions? You sure? Yes, I think there was one with the facility, uh, whether it is the knowledge of the people or not. Yes, so when these things are done, when the uh, clinical vignettes are given out and the res responses come, it actually does a few things. One, it helps us to know where the gaps are. So they do it for all cadre of staff. So they will start from the doctors to the midwives to the nurses to all cadre of staff. Now, at the end of it all, they will be able to tell that, no, we have a problem with the doctors, or we have a problem with the midwives, or we have a problem with this in this particular scenario. So it helps them to know where they should target with their training and, of course, uh, reach. But the point I was trying to make earlier was that sometimes you don't know whether, because some facilities don't have some infrastructure, they don't even bother to know about the condition. So if you put the clinical scenario to them, it will be foreign to them, okay? But I think at the end of the day, the clinical visits and the simulation or the drills will help us identify where we need to uh, focus our training. Because we know training also costs, so you want to know where the needs are and then you, you go accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before he goes away, is there something very burning? Somebody wanted to say something. Okay, please, one. Anybody, one, make it snap here since they haven't come to suck us. So thank you very much, Dr. Kumi, for that um, excellent presentation. What I basically want to say has to do with auditing of our own systems. It's very important. I think throughout yesterday and today, we flashed some red flags that should have been picked up. Now, the question I keep asking myself is, these people who saw these patients, have they been notified in a way? Have they come to the realization that, oh, you know, this was a situation that I should have picked up and missed? I mean, I don't think that they probably know. And if they don't know, it means that the situation would continue and it would fester. So we need to not only audit maternal mortalities, but also look at our near misses as well. This is important. This person eventually had a, an abruptio placenti and, and you know, needed to be taken care of. This is a maternal near miss. So has somebody looked at it and said that, okay, where did all this start from? It started from the fact that this blood pressure was not picked up. And can the one who saw this patient be giving some feedback? Because that's the only way we would, would make some inroads. If we don't, and we don't audit our systems, we would remain where we are. I like the idea of having to do, let me just round up quickly, having to do you know, simulations and all of that. But the reality is that we also need to learn from failures in the system. Then next time we can sit up and do better. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Sapoko, thank you very much. I think um, I'll just respond to that by saying that we actually need to be institutions with memory. Where, because oftentimes the bad outcomes we have repeat themselves because we haven't learned from them. But if we remain institutions with memory, just like happened in the aviation industry where they learned a lot from their mistakes and we all know how rigorous they are with their systems. We will be able to give feedback, like you said, and then learn from them so that the next person doesn't happen from. I mean, the problem has already happened. The question is whether it will happen to the next person. So feedback, I think, is important. And I appreciate your comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Enchi. Sorry, Dr. Kumi. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kumi. Uh, please, let's give him a, a round of applause. Um, so he, 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 we've learned something here, haven't we? That 
in order for us to improve on our EMOC, emergency obstetric care, uh, we, should not, we should just go beyond uh, signal functions and include clinical cascade and also clinical vignettes. And let's not forget that medicine is a practice. So as we practice, it is also good to share the knowledge. At least that is the impression I'm getting here that whatever we have found in our little corner somewhere, let us also share it just to make the life better for the people that we are trying to save. On that note, thank you very much for your time and for your attention, and let's clap for ourselves.